Um, we should begin in about, yep, we can start now. Thank you so much. Ready? Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, this is Shaliza from Nissa Helpline. And I have with me Sister Razia and Sister Samia. I am so happy that we're all spending the Saturday afternoon together. We are so happy to, to join uh, you with this discussion. I know it's um it's a it's a busy time, it's a spiritual time, and so much is going on. The weather is warm outside, and that makes it very different for us when it comes to different times of the year. We get really excited. Uh, when it's warm and it's nice outside. And um, what we wanted to spend this time with our Nissa Helpline viewers on today is dua. And, um, you know, I think, I think very often about how often do we make a heartfelt dua or how how often do we get into robotic dua or how often do we get too busy to make dua because you know like I said at the beginning the weather is good and our lives are good and alhamdulillah we are you know we live in in North America where we're, relatively things are calm um you know and that makes for for interesting and and very varied conversations and very varied um thoughts that we all have around dua I know some sometimes you know I've heard people say I wonder if my duas even get answered and I've heard people say I actually don't know if I need to make dua because I have everything I need mashallah I don't want to be asking for more now those are you know those are interesting conversations and I think those you know those are the pieces that we're going to start um, this discussion about with the day of Arafah fast approaching there is uh, no day which is greater than this day so we at the Sahel Line thought this is the best time to have this conversation with all our viewers, with all our callers, for all our supporters on the use of, or rather the, to not miss out on the opportunity to make sincere and effective dua. Like I said, I have Sister Samia and Sister Razia with me, and they're going to spend some time guiding us on how to structure dua more efficiently and with sincerity to please Allah. And talk to us a little bit about some of the thoughts that can come to us when we're too hesitant to make dua, or we're not sure if we're doing it right, um, or we're not sure if, if it's being answered, or if there's something else that we should be doing before or after, right? I think that the complexity of dua can sometimes hover over our minds when we think about what do I need to ask for and how do I have this conversation with Allah because really that you know some of us would consider it as conversation so first let me introduce uh, Ustad Samia she is the founder of Quranic Ocean where she teaches guided tadabur classes on how to build personal and emotional connections with Allah's words she completed her Quran memorization shortly after attaining her bachelor's degree in communications with a minor in psychology from Florida State University. She is a Quran teacher for Rabat and is currently working on an ijazah in Hafs recitation, inshallah. She's a single mom to two girls, one of whom is born with a rare syndrome called child and has special medical needs, alhamdulillah. She is a home barrister and loves making latte art. You got to show me how to do that. Um, <laughs> she hopes to help people dive deep into Quranic ocean so they can find comfort and reassurance through Allah's words amidst the varying circumstances of life. Uh, welcome, Sister Ustad uh, Samia. I also have with us Sister Razia Hamidi, who is no um, stranger and very uh, frequent supporter of us at Nissa Helpline. Um, she is a Muslim life coach and counselor. She believes that true change in our society and Ummah comes with individual couples. Individuals, couples, and families are healthier and stronger, not physically, but mentally as well. Sorry, not just physically, but mentally as well. She combines Islamic spirituality and counseling techniques to help one work through personal pain, strengthen themselves, and thrive in life while building our relationship or your relationship with Allah. Now that I've introduced both speakers, again, as I said in the beginning, this is a conversation about conversations that we would like to have with the Almighty. 
Uh, Sister Samia, I'm going to kick it off to you. Sister Razia, I welcome you to join in the conversation with us and, you know, with Sister Samia as well. Samia, we want to kick off with you on... What, why don't you start by sharing with us some powerful du'as in the Quran and deep dive into what can we learn from them? Inshallah, jazakumullah khair. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of your fasts for those who are fasting in the hijjah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala amplify our good deeds in these blessed days, ya Rabbil Alameen. I mean, so inshallah, what we'll do is dive deep into these ayat, inshallah. I have a few. Uh, it's from Quran.com, inshallah. And I think it's it's easier to look at the ayat, inshallah, visually while we're um, going into them. So bismillah, the first one I'll share is inshallah from Surah Al-Qamar, Surah 54. And this is of Prophet Nuh, alayhi salam. And I just want to share a few ayat from different surahs in the Quran, inshallah, before Ustad Razia speaks to us about... Um, you know, how to personalize your own du'as, right, inshallah. But the, the uh, Qur'an is the perfect, like, blueprint for us in terms of du'as, how to have a conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I wanted to start off with Prophet Nuh because Surah Nuh, which is not this surah, but Surah Nuh, which is a shorter chapter in the Qur'an, um, I call it the sacred conversation. It's just my, when, when I think of Surah Nuh, I think of a sacred conversation between one man and his creator. Because Surah Nuh, subhanAllah, almost from the, the fourth or fifth verse until the end is just a conversation between Nuh and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And him telling him, Ya Allah, I tried this with my people. And when this didn't work, I tried this. And then I did this and I did that. And Surah Nuh is beautiful in showing us how close he is to Allah. Now in Surah Al-Qamar here, very short verses, but subhanAllah, it gives us so much. What the first thing I want to start with is before we even get to his dua, What's interesting is what comes right before his dua. It says, وَقَالُوا مَجْنُونٌ وَزْدُجِرٌ Here it means that the people who Prophet Nuh was calling them to Allah, they're telling him here that you're just somebody who's crazy, right? They're, they're labeling him as a crazy person. And here, وَزْدُجِرٌ means that he was intimidated, intimidated by them. And another translation of this word is um, he was driven away. So imagine a scene of someone calling people to Allah and then he's driven away. What's interesting is the next verse, because what I love doing is connecting the, the end of the, 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 the end of one ayah of how it ends to the beginning of the next ayah and how it begins. So the end of verse nine ends saying was dujr, he was driven away. Immediately, it, the next verse starts with fada'a. Now he calls upon Allah. So you go from a scene of somebody being driven away, almost isolated, to them finding power in their ability to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what he understands here, that just because he was driven away by the entire community, doesn't mean he's driven away from Allah. Doesn't mean he's denied access from his creator. So it's beautiful, you see that he's driven away and immediately he knows the person who's always there, for, not the person, but the being who's always there for him, right? The creator who's always there for him, right? So that just because the people are driving you away, doesn't mean the creator is not there for you. And this is what he so wholeheartedly understands. And he tells us, you know, this verse tells us, Rabbahu. So now he calls upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so personally. And he says, Anni maghlubun, which is also so concise yet so powerful. I'm helpless. I'm overwhelmed. Fantasir. And these are almost like two polar opposite um, things going on. So imagine you saying, I'm completely overwhelmed. I have no capability to keep going anymore, right? I'm, I'm tired, I'm worn out. I have nothing left in me to keep going. And then that's one, that's, that's one fact, right? The second fact is fantasir. Now you're asking Allah to completely take over and give you victory, right? Nusra is not just help. Nusra is like, give me victory in a way that is uh, completely unimaginable, right? It's take you to a different situation where you're completely in uh, pure victory and triumph. So how can you go from recognizing how little you have in you to keep going to asking Allah to give you complete triumph and victory, right? And, and here's his understanding of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. 
right? Because sometimes we think we have nothing in us left. So how can we even ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, um, to take us to point Z, right? If we're at point A and we still haven't figured out point B, C, right? To get us to the end. Sometimes that stops us from actually asking. But here, Prophet Nuh understands who Allah is, right? So it doesn't pull him away. It actually attracts him more to who the creator is, right? So he comes to him more and he says, I'm completely overwhelmed. Ya Allah, you take over, right? Ya Allah, you give this victory to me, right? And immediately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what's beautiful is that imagine if this dua was here for us and we didn't see the end result. Imagine if, you know, Prophet Nuh's story ended at his dua. It could have, right? And we will still have something beautiful. But the fact is that Allah shows us the answer. And that only reassures us as human beings too, that Allah shows us not only the dua, but the answer of the dua, right? So immediately Allah says, فَفَتَحْنَا أَبْوَابَ السَّمَاءِ Allah says, we opened the gates of the sky with pouring rain, right? Like we, we showered him with answers. Not only did we answer him, but we showered him with answers. And the other thing I wanted to focus on is after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he bursts the earth be, be, uh, beneath him with springs. Look at what Allah says in verse 13. What I wanted to focus on is how Allah says, وَحَمَلْنَاهُ عَلَى ذَاتِ أَلْوَاحٍ وَدُسُرٍ Allah says, we carried him on planks and nails. Allah here doesn't mention al-fulk, right? Which is mentioned in other surahs in the Quran. Here Allah mentions, we carried him on something, right? Made of planks and nails, of just like wood, right? Just... And what's interesting is that the dua was so uh, concise yet powerful. I'm overwhelmed. Ya Allah, take over. Ya Allah, help me. And now Allah says we carried him. Someone who just echoed their inability to carry themselves further is now being carried. And Allah shows us how you don't know what can carry you and how Allah can carry you. Because here Allah could have said, we carried him on the strongest ark ever made in, you know, on, on human earth, right? But Allah says something so like simple, some planks and nails, right? And sometimes like we see the factors in front of us and we're like, how is this going to carry us? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us, it's not about what's physically carrying you, but the one who's really carrying you through what you have in front of you. Allah can carry you through anything, right? It's nothing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the one thing I wanted to focus on with Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. Just anni maghlubun. And what's beautiful is that here, he doesn't even ask Allah in detail what he wants. And sometimes we go through different situations, inshallah, Radia, Sister Radia, we'll talk about that. But, you know, sometimes you're, you're in a place where you know exactly what you want. And, and you have the list and you're like, Yalla, I want this in this way, Ya Allah, right? And that's beautiful. But sometimes you're just like so exhausted and overwhelmed and done. And you can't even put into words or articulate what you want. And all you can say is, Ya Allah, I'm done. I'm tired. And you just channeling that emotion is a dua in and of itself. Like how merciful of a creator that created us in a way that once we feel our emotions only, and channel it to him, it's a form of a dua. It's a form of an ask. All right, subhanAllah. And this is something we do with our friends maybe all the time. Like, Ya Allah, I'm just so tired. So imagine you saying the same thing, but to Allah, Ya Allah, I'm so tired. This is a dua, subhanAllah. Right? So it's an encouragement for us to continue to talk to Allah, to have these sacred conversations right, of our feelings and pouring it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what we learn from Prophet Nuh and also Prophet Musa here in Surah Al-Qasas. So now in Surah 28, Surah Al-Qasas, and it's, you know, a more, I would say, uh, popular verse that goes around a lot. I've heard it several times, right? right? A lot of people, you know, memorize this verse, which is a beautiful verse to, to memorize. But what's interesting, and I think sometimes it gets uh, lost, is where he made this dua and when he made this dua, right? For us to recognize when did, Prophet Musa alayhi salam, where was he? In what circumstance was he when he made this dua? Oh Allah, I'm truly in desperate, dire need of any good you give me. When did he say this actually? It's number one, he had just been almost kicked out from his city, right? He's, he's fleeing from his city. He doesn't know where he's going. 
He has nothing on him, right? He's completely alone. He doesn't know where to go. He's looking for refuge. And right then and there, he goes to Madian, the city, and he sees people, two women, who needed to water their, their flocks. And I, I want you to imagine the scene that you're completely alone, you're stranded, you're scared, there's people back there looking for you in the city you grew up in, right? You have no security in the city you're in, you're a stranger in the city. And now all of a sudden, you're caring about two women and their situation. What empathy, right? And what um, faith do you have to have to actually care about anyone else in that situation, right? For him to actually notice, right? He notices two women and he asks him, you know, you know, like, well, what is it? What's going on? All right. You know, how many of us wouldn't, would just be so overwhelmed by our circumstance and be so only self-centered, but because he was Allah centered, he saw others too, right? So he sees them and he asks them. And then when he realizes that they needed help, he helps them. He waters their flock for them. And then immediately after watering, helping people, right? He goes back to this tree, right? He goes back to this shade that he finds. And he says this dua in that situation. He's, he's just done a small ounce of good for people. And perhaps that doing of good for someone helps you see the good you have in your creator being with you. And no wonder that a prescription for faith is to give because giving is receiving. So in his giving, his heart receives a dua and he's making this dua immediately after he gave. And he says, Rabbi inni lima anzalta ilayya min khayran faqir. And look at the word anzalta. Anzalta is actually almost like a past that you've already sent it. It's not satunzilu. Satunzilu would be that what well, you will in the future gave me. But he's so confident in his creator they said, what you've already given me, it's already coming. The khair is already coming and it started with him giving khair, with him being good for others, right? And then he says, faqir, he says like, I'm in dire need of any good you give me, right? I'm in dire need of it. That like, Ya Allah, like, I love to be impoverished to you because you are al-ghani, right? The worst thing we can do is say, I'm faqir to any human on earth because they're limited. And only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is self-sufficient where he can continue giving, right? So here he's saying, Ya Allah, help me only stay faqir to you because I only want to receive from you. And the khair is only going to come from you. This is a beautiful dua, dua to memorize. And what's beautiful is, again, physically he had nothing. Right? So you can have nothing physically around you, but just in your remembrance of Allah, you have everything. And you know, the companions would say, subhanAllah, that if kings knew what we had in our hearts, they would fight us with swords for it, right? And why is that? Because the internal is so extremely powerful. That internal faith you have in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you can have nothing on a physical level, but have everything just in your ability to access Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In your awareness that I can access Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right now. And this is what we learn from Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Now, moving on to other prophets, inshallah, is in Surah Al-Anbiya, which is the Surah of Prophets, Surah 21. And I, I call this page, whenever you get to this page in Surah Al-Anbiya, starting at verse 83, I call this page the Fastajabna verses that we answered. We answered because you see one answer after the next, one answer after the next, subhanAllah, these beautiful uh, verses. But it starts with Ayyub. And Ayyub salam says here in verse 83, Again, explaining his situation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is called dua al-hal, the dua of the situa situation, right? Oh Allah, this is my situation and you're the most merciful. He doesn't ask to be cured physically, right? He doesn't say, Ya Allah, I'm sick, so cure me. But instead he says, Oh Allah, I'm afflicted with this and you are the most merciful. The two exist together, right? SubhanAllah, like imagine his faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that was a dua in and of itself. Right? Again, him telling Allah his situation and acknowledging Allah's mercy on him is a dua in and of himself. And Allah says, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ That we answered him. 
But what I want to focus on is the end of verse 84. Look what Allah says after we answered Ayub. Allah says, this is as a rahma from us that we answered Ayub and wa lil abidin. This is a reminder for every single abid on earth. Every single abid. Are you a habit of Allah? Are you a worshiper of Allah? Because if you are, Allah is saying, the answer of Ayub is the, an answer for you too. This is a lesson for you too. وَذِكْرَ الْعَابِدِينَ So every worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ayub's answer is their answer too. This is a lesson for you too. Right? What can you take away from this? This first ayah that we just covered right here in this surah was a dua of the hal, dua of your situation. The next two verses that I will talk about in the, in the same surah, on the same page actually, in the mushaf, are different types of asks. So here is the dua of the hal, dua of you asking Allah by your situation. Now, the next dua I wanted to cover is the noon, who's Yunus alayhi salam. Yunus alayhi salam, rather than saying, oh Allah, I'm in the dark, right? Which would be the dua al-hal. Here, what does he say? La ilaha illa anta subhanaka. Inni kuntu min al So here he's acknowledging his wrong. So, and, and that's, can you imagine, subhanAllah, again, how merciful Allah is, that you can come to Allah in dua while acknowledging something in your past that you were not so proud of. How many times do we not feel safe coming to people, maybe our own family, saying our wrong, right? And, and, and knowing that we're going to be safe. But here he knows that not only am I going to be safe, but this is a tool of dua. It's a tool of dua to bring up my past with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Inni kuntu bin al-dhalimeen. Admitting you're wrong. Right? Telling Allah. That's a form of dua. And that's a means of answers. And then also here, la ilaha illa ant. He acknowledges that there's no deity worthy of worship who will accept him the way he is right now. There's no deity that can take him and remove him out of darkness upon darkness upon darkness in the, in the belly of the whale except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that there's no darkness Allah cannot remove you from. He acknowledges that. He says, la ilaha, there's no one but you. La ilaha illa ant. Right? And this is a dua we're all encouraged to make. La ilaha illa anta. Subhanaka inni kuntu min al right? And that was a dua of Yunus alayhi sana. And now when Allah answers him, Allah says, وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِي الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And this is how we save every believer. So now Yunus's dua is not just Yunus's dua and his answer. It's also an answer for you too. Allah reassuring you. You see the darkness he was in? This is how I save every believer too from the darknesses they face. وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِي الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Look at the reassurances packed in these ayat, subhanAllah, for every believer, for every reader who's going to read these ayat. And then Zakaria alayhi salam, Zakaria in verse 89 is going to ask Allah for an offspring. And in Surah Maryam, what's interesting is that his form, his way of, of dua was very specific. So we talked about asking Allah, right, just in your situation. Zakaria salam was one who was very specific. He knew exactly what he wanted, right? He says, Rabbi la tadarni fardan. Ya Allah, don't leave me alone. Right? Ya Allah, do not leave me alone. And in Surah Maryam, he will say, Oh Allah, he will name the obstacles. My wife is barren. I'm old. I'm weak. So give me a child. And subhanAllah, how many of us are, are able to list the obstacles in front of us? And those obstacles only deter us from making a dua and prevent us and stop us from even making dua. But for him, it compelled him even further to make a dua because he knew who Allah was. So here he is in a dua, subhanAllah, in Surah Maryam. And here, right, listing the obstacles and saying, Ya Allah, because of these obstacles, you have no obstacles. Give me this, subhanAllah. And when Allah answers him in verse 90, Allah says, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ We answered him, number one. وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ يَحْيَى We gave him his son Yahya and we made his wife barren, number three. Now, logically, what do you think needs to come first? Logically, you would say, Allah answered him and Allah made his wife fertile. And then, وَهَبْنَا لَهُ يَحْيَى But Allah shows you that there's no factors for Allah. Because Allah doesn't need the wife to be fertile for, for Allah to grant her a son. 
there's no factor for Allah. The factors are are are, are only human logic, right? Are only through uh, through humans that that we have to work through the factors. But Alhamdulillah, for us having an access to a Creator, who there's no factors for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And this, when you connect this to, you know, Dhikr al Abidin in verse eighty four, what are you a abid of? What are you a worshiper of? Are you a habit of the circumstances, of the obstacles, of the factors around you? Or are you a habit of Allah? Because if like Zakaria, you're a habit, you're a servant of Allah, not of the factors, no obstacle will deter you from making dua. Right? Because you're a habit of Allah, period. Right? And Allah shows us, subhanAllah, right, that the, the, the Yahya came before here, right? Yahya alayhi salam, the answer of Yahya came before his wife becoming fertile. Maybe perhaps to show us how all possible Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And then immediately after that answer, Allah will tell us what made Zakaria special. Immediately, what's the first thing that Allah will label him as? Kanu yusari'una fil khayrat. They would rush to goodness. And who just did that? Musa alayhi salam. You see how rushing to goodness is also a means of Allah answering your dua, right? Why are we supposed to give? Why are we supposed to, you know, why are we in Dhul Hijjah? Why are you cooking for your neighbor today, perhaps, right? Why are you doing this? Why are you um, um, giving in Sadaqah in Dhul Hijjah? Because giving is also a means of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answering you too on an individual level. Because we're an ummah. We are one. And... Now, inshallah, the last thing I want to share is Ibrahim alayhi salam because we can't be in the hijjah in the times of hajj without mentioning Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. You know, our father Ibrahim, as Allah says in the end of Surah Al-Hajj. And here in Surah Ibrahim, in verse 37, he tells Allah, Rabbana inni askantu min dhuriyati biwadin ghayri liza. Oh Allah, I have settled my offspring in a barren valley near your sacred house. Now, who ordered Ibrahim alayhi salam to put Hajar and his son there, right? It was Allah. It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? It was Allah's command to put him in this circumstance that was extremely difficult, emotionally, physically, in all ways, right? And, but look at his dua. He doesn't say, oh Allah, Rabbana, innaka qultali, you ordered me to come here. So I did this. He says, oh Allah, I have put my family here. How much of a Muslim he was. The embodiment of taslim, submission. Allah said, I did, no question asked. So yeah, Allah, I have put them here. And now he's making the dua. Right? That Allah's yasha, Allah wants this. That's what I want too. That was Ibrahim alayhi salam. That, that was his Islam. Right, subhanAllah. So now he makes this dua, oh Allah, I have settled my family in this place. And he describes the place of being physically barren of fruits. So if I'm telling you, right, if I'm making dua, right, logically speaking, if I'm saying, oh Allah, this place has no fruits. So you would think immediately I'm going to say, so give it fruits, right? It goes from no, from no fruits, no vegetation to fruits. But before he mentions the physical nourishment, he mentions the spiritual first. He says, Rabbana liyuqimu salah. Oh Allah, so they can establish prayer and connect with you here. So make hearts inclined to this place and give them from the thamarat. And now give them from the physical nourishment. So he understands here that true nourishment is soul, spiritual food, not the physical. The physical came last in his dua. Right? He first asks Allah, Oh Allah, give them soul nourishment and then he says he says oh allah make hearts inclined to be here ibrahim Aizam made dua for your heart right he's not making dua for you to physically eat from mecca but on a spiritual level, for you to be connected to Allah through this place, because that's what matters. And right now, you know, how many of us are on here? About 40, mashallah. Every single one of us probably has had at least once in your lifetime a heart inclination to be in Mecca. Maybe even this year, Ya Allah, take me to Hajj. 
Ya Allah, I want to be there. That is an answer of Prophet Ibrahim's dua for you. That he made dua for your heart to incline to be here. Why? Not for you to be physically fed, but for your soul to be spiritually fed. Right? For you to be able to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, you know, the, these verses are so beautiful. And I highly encourage you later to read the end of Surah Ibrahim. But also I wanted to focus on this verse right here, verse 40. In verse 40, right before, he has just said, Inna Rabbi la dua. Allah indeed answers all prayers. And I want you to imagine the scene. You're completely alone. And someone affirms to you, Allah is answering your dua right now. Allah is hearing your dua right now. Right? If you have that affirmation in your heart and mind, whatever comes next is the essence of your life. Right? If right now, you know, Allah is hearing me right now. Whatever you're going to make for dua for next is the essence of your life. That's what you really care about. And where is Ibrahim salam's mindset? What does he say after affirming the fact that Allah indeed hears dua? He says, Rabbi ja'alni muqeem as-salah wa min dhuriyati. He says, oh Allah, make me and my descendants from those who connect with you. And not just physical prayer, because salah at the end of the day is a silah. It's a connection between Allah, you and Allah. So he's saying, Ya Allah, make me and everybody who comes after me connectors with you. Right? Those who connect with you, that's all that matters. Because Ya Allah, if I'm connected to you, I have everything. Because even if you're cut off from everything like Musa alayhi salam was, you know, almost expelled out like Nuh alayhi salam was, right? you always have access to Allah. So if you have that sila, you have everything. And that's the one thing that he emphasizes in the end of his dua. Right? So may Allah make us from these people who are from muqima salah, from those who are connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, praying to him and from our offspring. Amin ya rabbal alameen. I highly encourage you to make this dua. Um, Sheikh Yasir Burjas taught us in the salah workshop, memorize this dua and make it. Right? Memorize this dua, verse 40 in Surah 14 and make it often, right? Because this is the essence of life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us, inshallah. May we learn from these prophets and from these beautiful du'as that we have in the Quran. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. I, I, um, in, in reflection, as we kicked off, I heard, you know, in times um, of adversity, in times of reflection, um, in times of gratitude from all of these examples that you've shared. Um, you know, without further, I think I'm going to ask Sister Razia to share with us some strategies some tips on how do we increase the strength of our du'as? What mindset should we adopt? And what else can we do when we find ourselves in that space where we are needing to make dua or we are making dua and we are left with um, doubt or we're left with, did I do it right? Did I ask, okay, am I asking for too much? Um, and I think that's the, you know, we, we've, we've heard all of the big pieces from, from Sasamia, all of those reflections on all the type of dua and, and the words that were used. And sometimes it can feel a little intimidating, right? Because I think, you know, when I read those and I see the duas of the prophets, I always say, well, will I ever be so articulate to find those words to make that connection? And I think it's sometimes a little bit intimidating. So Sister Asya, I think, you know, my, my question to you is, what mindset should we be adopting? And what, what else can you share with us in the how of dua? Um, alaikum everyone and Jazakallah Khair Samia that was so beautiful I was taking notes and I know my heart needed it um I had watched Samia I, th I think it was a couple months ago you had shared that dua of Zakri Islam and I remember my mind just being blown because I'd never caught that sequence subhanallah of you know how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
um, answers first and, you know, how logically where our brain goes of what needs to happen for, you know, a child and how Allah on the answers it. So it was just so uplifting. Um, and I love, I love, mashallah, um, Sanya's reflections and the way that, alhamdulillah, she's able to go so deep in the Quran. Um, you know, Allah subhanahu is the best of planners. And I feel like what I prepared for you guys is a perfect uh, compliment to where Samia, the trip she just took us on, mashallah, and how hopefully I get to tie it together and inshallah bring it to a practical com component as well um, to strengthen us during these blessed days and inshallah during uh, especially the day of Arafah. So Shaliza, your question is great. It can sometimes feel intimidating. Intimidating. We read the eloquence um, that the prophets had and you know, sometimes we feel like we're at a loss for words. And one of the things I try to remind myself, inshallah, is A, that alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa gives us the words. So when you feel like you're at a loss, you know, here are so many, an abundance of du'as that Allah subhanahu wa has given us in the Quran the prophets use that we can take, inshallah, make our own, allow it to inspire yours. But also to remember that du'a is not about the right words. It's about the right focus and belief. And I feel like what Sister Samia, alhamdulillah, just took us through, I, like one powerful line that I'm holding on to for sure is, you know, are you a slave of circumstance? Or are you a slave of the Almighty? Right? And that is really, alhamdulillah, what we, inshallah, should all strive to remember. And so if I am a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and my focus is on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his names, his attributes, his promises, then I, it doesn't worry, you know, the circumstances don't shape me. The circumstances don't shape me, right? And that's what I would encourage us to hold on to. So I'm going to share um, a few things that I hope you can hand, add to your toolbox, inshallah, during these blessed days, during Arafah, and continue with you um, in your, inshallah, relationship with Allah subhanahu wa when it comes to dua. One of the things I was try to ground myself in when we have this conversation, and, you know, the goal is to make dua our default setting. Right. Um, just as any time that we have something in our life um, and, you know, our default might be to call someone, to check our phone, whatever it may be, to make dua our default setting, because dua is not a reminder to Allah subhanahu wa Right. It's not a reminder to Allah of what we need. Dua is a reminder to Allah subhanahu wa of who we are and that we are the ones in need. And I think so often when there's that disconnect, um, that's where the pain comes up. So alhamdulillah, it's very humbling to remind ourselves of how hungry and of how much need we have for Allah subhanahu wa in every moment. And I truly believe that's one of, one of the most freeing parts of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa that I am I am desperately in need. And my Rabb's door is constantly open to me. I want to share one of the verses of Surah Talaq, um, Surah 65, verse 2 to 3, that Alhamdulillah, can, inshallah, we can incorporate and grounding ourselves when it comes to having this mindset of being in need. And that is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and whosoever fears Allah and keeps his duty to him, he will make a way for him to get out from every difficulty. And he will provide for him from sources he, he never could imagine. And whosoever puts his trust in Allah, then he will suffice him. And verily, Allah will accomplish his purpose. And indeed, Allah has set a set measure of all things. I love this ayah. This ayah subhanAllah is so comforting whenever I need that boost to take my dua to the next level. When I need that um, boost to push through the noise, again, the circumstances. And that is, you know, this beautiful promise, right? This is the promise of Allah subhanAllah that when you rely on him as you should, he will open doors for you from where you can't imagine. He is sufficient for you beyond what you can imagine. And again, for us to ask ourselves, you know, which promises am I holding on to? Right in these blessed days, when we want to come closer to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, when we want to hold on to dua tighter than we hold on to the worldly things we have in our life and the realities, we need to ask ourselves, what are the promises of Allah Subhanahu wa I have? And again, Sister Samia gave some beautiful, I think, promises of Allah Subhanahu that we can hold on to through those duas, inshallah. So add this to your toolbox. And I really, you know, I'm Alhamdulillah, um, I get inspired by the questions that Allah asks us in the Quran. I think this is a beautiful way that Allah has shown us to challenge our thinking. I think one of the diseases of the heart that we have, the modern diseases, is like the passive um, you know, the passive engagement, the entertainment, subhanAllah, um, just last, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was with my nephew, he's like him and my niece, um, my nephew and niece are like seven and, you know, six years old, and he's so young, right, and he's, and, he, and alhamdulillah, they don't have screen time, but it was just so interesting, we're having this conversation, he's like, I just need some entertainment, and I'm like, what, like, what do you mean you need entertainment, like, who, you know, what kid says that, 
but it, the reality is that subhanAllah, like we're so, and there's an b- amazing book I'd encourage you guys to read, Amusing Ourselves to Death, but basically the addiction of entertainment, right? Our brains don't want to think anymore. We don't want to be engaged. Like, let's be real. I know there's 32 of you, but how many of us are sitting there in our evening and being like, oh, I just want Netflix versus oh, I just want some fasir. Like I need some commentary, right? We don't, like we don't want to activate our brains. And so the invitation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Quran is think, think, reflect, right? And so a lot of the questions that I think inshallah we need to engage with is asking ourselves, what am I the slave of? right? What am I, This like, again, the, you know, am I a slave of a certain circumstance? But the reality is that many of us have adopted certain promises of dunya versus the promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'd highly encourage you, inshallah, start asking yourself, what promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do I live with? What promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do I truly feel and have certainty in? Do I have yaqeen in? And when it comes to your dua journey, this is so formative. If you're not checking what promises of Allah you are holding or not holding on to, it will be really hard for you to go deeper with your du'a, to make du'a your default setting. So I'm just keeping it real with everyone, inshallah, reminding ourselves, right? Ask yourself, what are the promises I hold? And to give you a little window, when like, if you're like, what is she talking about with promises, right? So this verse just, I, I just read, there's like five, six promises we could break down in there from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But another one is also like another way to frame it is truths. So when we say time is money, this is a promise we hold. That, you know, somewhere I have believed that time is money. And so I believe when I'm not fruitful, when I'm not productive, well, I don't have worth because I'm not producing something. This is a promise that we somehow believe to be true, right? So similarly, we want to challenge this. Well, what does Allah subhanahu wa say, right? What does Allah subhanahu wa say about time? What does Allah subhanahu wa say about the ones who ask on him? What does Allah subhanahu wa say of the ones who call upon him? So this is, inshallah, like a very simple, practical way of us understanding where maybe our relationship with du'a, our relationship with calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been fogged. And again, the du'as that Sister Sammy has shared, go into them deeper because there's a lot of inspiration there. There's a lot of practical um, ways we can see ourselves in those situations when Prophet Musa Islam is feeling utterly desperate, when he has nothing else in his control, right? Many of us, again, tend to... Um, weaken our relationship with du'a when we feel like, you know, everything's just spiraling, right? And subhanAllah, here's a very real example of a prophet who at that point had nothing in his life, had nothing within his control, and he makes his du'a. So how do I react when I'm in that situation? Uh, One of the other things, inshallah, um, I want us to very much ground ourselves with is despair isn't part of Allah's hadha's language. It is part of shaitan's. Despair is a satanic quality. And subhanAllah, day and age that we live in, we have to be very mindful of what we expose our heart and minds to. And I'm not even talking about the entertainment. I'm talking about the conversations we have with one another. Like how many of us, the default settings in our conversations is just criticizing, right? Like criticizing community, criticizing the state of the ummah. Oh my God, people are like this. Oh, have you seen that? Right? Like subhan, this is language that leads down the path of despair. Like, When's the last time when you had such a conversation that you left feeling, wow, I'm going to do something about the world. You know, I'm going to, subhanAllah, we've got so many resources. That's not how we think. You you tend to even go deeper into, well, this is just what it is. There's nothing I can do. So I would really encourage you during these blessed days, you know, alhamdulillah, these blessed days are a recharge for us, right? It's a refresh. Try to be mindful of conversations that you have or situations you're in that lead to despair and try to pull yourself in out of that into hope. And so inshallah, the tools I want to give you guys um, in these 15 minutes I have with you is inshallah, how to feed hope in our life. And again, one of the practical ways I would encourage you to question daily to ask yourself is how do I feed my hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because if you're not feeding your hope in Allah, you're definitely feeding despair. You don't just stay stagnant. Your heart is moving one way or the other. So how do I feed hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This can be through acts. This can be through certain verses. This is inshallah through certain practices you can establish. But find those things and actually be aware of them and protect them. How do I feed my hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So one of the first and foremost things that we can feed hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with is dua. Dua is an act of hope. Dua is a reminder to your heart, inshallah, to your soul of regardless of what's around me, again, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above all this. Dua is, Ya Allah, I have hope in you. I have hope in what you can do. I have hope in the doors you will open for me, regardless of what I see around me. And so inshallah, just 
doing and having this conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through our dua is an act of hope. You need to remember that. So even when you're feeling weak in whatever situation it is, alhamdulillah, by making this act of dua, this act of ibadah, you are affirming to yourself and you are affirming to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, I believe in you and I believe in your promise. I believe in what is possible. And that is what I'm holding on to. So adwa is the ultimate act of hope. And alhamdulillah, during these blessed days, we see that in the story of, um, of Hajar al -Salam. Her act of even running between Safa and Marwa was an act of hope. But through that, that was also her affirmation of believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? At taking action is, um, alhamdulillah, a sign of like what I'm making dua for, right? When I take action, it's affirming that I know Allah's going to answer. You know, you guys have probably heard that quote or meme that gets shared, like, don't make dua for rain and leave your house without an umbrella, right? Like, you've got to have that level of certainty. So she was making that, like, she had hope that Allah was going to send something for her and her son. And then she started running. So inshallah, you know, doing during these blessed days, take the moments and reflect also on the beautiful acts of hope that we see through the story of Prophet Ibrahim Islam. The next one, um, to feed inshallah hope and to strengthen our duas during these blessed days and in our life, having a good opinion of Allah subhanahu. Right? It comes down to the basics, guys. Like it's alhamdulillah, out of Allah subhanahu's mercy, the deen is not complicated. And so you've got to ask yourself, right? How do I view Allah subhanahu wa How do I hear my Rabb when it comes to whatever you know you're you're struggling with right now in your life? Whatever the something that your heart desires right now, asking yourself, right? How do I connect? How do I hear Allah subhanahu? How do I see my Lord in this dawn? How do I see my Lord's promise in this situation that I have in my life? Um, one of the most beautiful, you know, Hadith Qudsis that I love holding on to. It's obviously a longer Hadith Qudsi, but um, just a short part for us right now where Allah subhanahu wa says, I am as my servant thinks of me. If you view Allah in a good light, you will have that goodness and you will see that goodness. It will overpower any other limitation that you are seeing or any perceived limitation that you view in your in your life right now, right? Dua, alhamdulillah, um, the way I always explain hope is non-Muslims have hope. A person who doesn't even believe in God has hope. The believer's hope is not to have superficial hope, but it's to have hope where you can't even see it. I can't even imagine how this door is going to open or where that door even exists, but I know who my Lord is, right? And Prophet Musa Salam's life is like filled with so many of those miraculous, right? I, I love using the word miracle because I feel like we've lost touch with awe of Allah subhanahu wa divine power in our day and age. We read these miracles in the Quran and we think like, oh, it's for that time. But subhanAllah, there are miracles in our life. We can all think of incredible du'as and moments Allah has given us. And so I love using the word miracle in my vocabulary daily to remind myself that Allah subhanahu wa divine power is here right now. That the same Lord who, who opened the sea for Prophet Musa Islam, the same Lord who cooled the fire for Prophet Ibrahim Islam is the same Lord I am making dua to. And so having a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ask yourself, what do I truly believe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his goodness in this situation? So make it very specific to yourself, right? Whatever dua it is that you are right now desiring to call upon Allah, whatever circumstance you're struggling with right now in your life, ask yourself, how do I view Allah in that situation? What are the limitations I have placed on Allah's path as power in my life, Billah, right? But we got to catch it. You've got to catch that for yourself. So don't focus on the reason why you can't, but focus on Allah who can. Don't focus on the reason you can't, but focus on Allah who can, inshallah. Um, simple th study, because I love to like throw in studies where I can. I just felt like subhanAllah makes it really practical for us. Um, so again, when you focus on goodness, you know, Allah subhanahu wa gives us that, right? And Sister Samia, mashallah, like, you know, drove that point home beautifully. But when we truly, again, I want you to make it very specific to you, right? Let's say, you know, may Allah subhanahu protects us like you've just been laid off from work. Maybe, you know, your child is ill. Maybe there's an opportunity you've been making dua for, you know, your business, whatever it may be that you're struggling with right now. Really focus in on that and ask yourself, okay, how do I think of Allah subhanahu in that situation? And inshallah, now, how can I replace it? What is something? What is a verse? What is a belief I can add that I know true and reflective of my Lord? 
So here's a simple study that drives this point. Like, again, it's a human example for us. We never bring Allah subhanahu to our level. This is for our limited understanding. So there was a study they did with um, women who uh, were cleaners at a hotel. They were, you know, housekeeping. And they told these women, half of them, they just said, you know, we're just monitoring you. Keep doing your work. Um, you know, we, we're just kind of monitoring how your energy, like, I don't know, they made up something bogus. Okay, so they're like, okay. And then half of the women um, that were these housekeepers, they told them, we want to um, track how many calories you guys burn in a day in the work that you're doing. And so we want you to just like keep this calorie tracker. And, you know, we like what you're doing is a really great workout. So we want to track the calories you burn. So they're continuing doing the same tasks. But now half these women are told that what they're doing is a workout. What they're doing is actually physical activity. Well, guess what, subhanAllah, two weeks later, they, they come and monitor the group. The group that is told that they're working out lost five pounds just by being told what you're doing is physical activity. What they started to believe and how they saw themselves, subhanAllah, actually impacted their calorie um, burning. The reason I share the study is when you truly believe in a situation that you are in, that my Rabb is Al-Fatah, he opens doors. That my Lord will open from where I can't imagine, you will only see open doors. But if you don't believe that, you know what, this can't happen because the economy is bad, this can't happen because the doctor said this to me, then all you will see is closed doors. And so it is absolutely subhanAllah essential for us to ask ourselves, how do I see my Lord, right? Allah subhanahu wa says, I am as my servant thinks of me. How do you think of your Lord in that specific situation? So keep getting really specific for yourself, inshallah, especially before Arafah. And you're going to, inshallah, make the list of du'as that you want to make in this blessed day. If you're doing the Hajj, again, like a daily practice we want to have, but we want to amp it up. Use these blessed days as a springboard for yourself. Inshallah, this is going to help shape that. So I love making it very specific. The final thing I'm going to give you guys, inshallah, is knowledge of Allah subhanahu names. We, alhamdulillah, I'm sure have constantly been reminded of the importance of knowing Allah subhanahu wa names and attributes. Again, I would encourage you, pick five. Like pick five for the rest of the year, right? Don't overwhelm yourself. Like if you can take five names and you can live with them and you can love them and you can see them everywhere and you see and you internalize Allah subhanahu wa attributes, just these five, you're way ahead of the game. I think sometimes, you know, we want to do everything and then we don't end up doing anything or we shut down and um, we get overwhelmed. So I would really encourage you, go and pick five of Allah's Pada's names right now that you're like, my heart just needs these. And so I'm just going to share a couple with you, um, inshallah. So I already shared one, Al-Fatah. I love Allah's Pada's name, Al-Fatah, the opener, right? And it's not just like, you know, sometimes we're like, okay, how do I, like, how do I understand the same? What do I do with it? So again, wherever you feel like the doors are closed for you, Remember that he is the one who opens. And sometimes it's not just physical doors, right? And opportunities for us. Sometimes it's internal where you feel like there's healing that, you know, hasn't happened. Doors internally that you feel like are closed, like things that you believe about yourself, right? SubhanAllah, how many of us struggle with our own internal baggage? Allah SWT can open your heart to certain things. So call upon Allah SWT with, Allah SWT with this beautiful name that, Ya Allah, you open. It can be relationships. You know, subhanAllah, how many of us have family ties that are severed? Things that, you know, people's hearts were closed off. Ya Allah, open, open their hearts. Ya Allah, open the bonds between us. The other name that I would, inshallah, encourage you to go deeper in is al Karim. Allah SWT is the most generous. Right, Al Karim, where are you in need of Allah Subhanahu Wa generosity? Where are you in need of Allah Subhanahu Wa generosity? Um, you know, in your life again, in the relationships that uh, you have with your own self. Sometimes we're so cheap with ourselves. One of the ways I love framing dua is dua is you being generous to yourself. Right, stop being cheap. Like dua is Allah, Allah Subhanahu Wa dominion is vast and abundant. And so when you're like, mm, and I'm not going to make the offer, I'm not sure. I'm like, you're just you're being stingy. So, you know, being Al-Kareem, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's call upon the one who's generous and be generous to yourself by calling upon him and inshallah having this act. Um, the final name that inshallah I'll give you here is actually one of the first names that was revealed. And I think it's just, you know, again, subhanAllah, the infinite mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the name he chose to introduce himself by, right? In Surah um, al the first one of the first new, few names is Al-Akram. The one who is the most, the intense form of Allah Subhanahu's generosity. That think of all the names Allah Subhanahu could have introduced Himself by, and in this, the you know, first verses that it comes down, Allah Subhanahu gives us the name Al-Aqr. 
that the one who is so intensely generous, this is the Lord that you call upon. This is the Lord that you want to have a relationship with. This is the one who relieves every hardship from you when you call upon him. And, you know, inshallah, by holding on to some of these names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we talked about making dua our default setting, by alhamdulillah connecting deeper and living by these names, by calling upon Allah subhanahu these attributes, but trying to see the manifestation of these attributes in our lives. Like when you see something generous, you know it comes from the one who is all generous. When you see those acts of kindness, even by a non-Muslim who doesn't even believe in their Lord, right? That is still from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's absolutely incredible. And the final tidbit I'll give you here is um, asking ourselves, you know, I, so I said, you know, stop and reflect on how do... I think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the other part I'll leave you with here is whatever da, you know, I hear this too often and it breaks my heart when people say this. So I really encourage you, inshallah, don't ever use this phrase, Allah has not answered my da. Because we do not know how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like right now, if you have health, for example, this could be an answer to a dua you've been making, right? Maybe you haven't, it hasn't been answered in the exact way that you wanted. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you something better. So we should never say Allah has not answered my dua because we do not know. But we should always just say, you know, I'm waiting for dua to be answered in this specific way. But my Rabb answers. And so one of the other things I would encourage, if there's a dua that you feel, you know, is still um, pending in the way that you are asking, ask yourself, how do I hear my Lord? How do I hear my Lord? Because all of us are hearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we truly pause and listen. And so inshallah, we have to start asking ourselves, how do I hear my rab when it comes to that dua? And I would encourage you, this is why a relationship to the Quran is so important and the beautiful verses that we got to hear today and, and do a little deep dive into, that those are the words of my Lord. Those are, alhamdulillah, not just the promises, but the reassurances of my Lord. Do I hear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through that? And many times when I ask people this question and I, you know, unfortunately I'll get like a dumbfounded look where there's like, what, like, what, sister, what are you talking about? Like, what do you mean? How do I hear my Lord? We want the Quran to be a living truth for us. The Quran is a living miracle that we continue to have, right? And so the more that you inshallah have a relationship with the Quran, you literally want those verses to be the thoughts that go through your head. So right now, if I told you, for example, you're an idiot, you'd be like, oh, yeah, I say that 100 times a day. Very familiar thought. Thank you, Razia. But if I said, for example, um, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, indeed, Allah has set a measure for all things, right? Allah does not burn a soul, than, a soul more than they can handle. You're like, wow, I, that's not a thought that crosses my mind a lot, right? So that's, that's what we're talking about when we say make the Quran your truth. That if these other random silly thoughts that have no place in the believer's mind are my reality, and that is how I hear the world, well, I need to replace it with how I hear my Lord and hear it through his words, and not what I have projected, my own weakness that I've projected onto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my limitations that I've projected onto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, um, you know, these are, inshallah, ways that you can ground yourself in strengthening your dua. I hope, inshallah, you know, during the day of Arafah, start it right now, right? Like, I'm sure a lot of us are feeling really inspired, inshallah, with the reminders today. Take it right now. Go and do some dua right after this session. Process it and try to, like, apply two or three things. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people of dua. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people who strive to hold on to his rope, regardless of what the circumstances around us um, are doing. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all to remember him and to, inshallah, come to Hajj. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us all to be there um, soon. Jazakallah khair, subhanakallahumma, bihamdik, ashadu la ilaha illa ant, wa astagfiratu gulaik. Sister Razia, you've sent us down this uh, path. I mean, I started off with Samia. She sent me down this spiritual journey. She reminded us of all these beautiful du'as in the Quran. Sister Razia, you've, you've told us the how. And before I do my closing um, comments for tonight, inshallah, I actually want to bring Sister Samia back because I, I, I'm i interested to hear your reflections on um, Sister Razia's uh, strategies and mindsets and and practical tools that she's shared with us so far. That was beautiful, mashallah. I, I took a lot of notes, alhamdulillah, inshallah, I'll share them. Um, but subhanAllah, um, I, I love the point about knowing who Allah is and his names. And, um, you know, because we all go through different circumstances, you know how like almost every year, like people ask you like, what was your like word for this year? You know, so imagine asking each other every year, like what name of Allah resonated with you most this year and subhanallah you know my friend and i started doing that recently alhamdulillah 
and because we all live through different circumstances, you know, every day almost, right? Every year, every month, all the time things are changing, subhanAllah. But really, really, sometimes one name of Allah will stand out for you more than another because of your own life circumstances. And Allah's names are here for us because, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't need to tell us who he is for him to be al-ghani, right? Like we are the ones who need his names, right? We are the ones who um, can feel reassurance through different names of his based on what we're going through. And, um, you know, subhanAllah, one thing that I want, two names that I wanted to add, inshallah, to the list. I know you, you mentioned a lot, but for me is uh, when you mentioned Hajar's story, uh, when I meant, remember Hajar and the, the Sa'i that she did, you know, her, her literally her sabr, her sabr in action. I love the quote that you shared about, you know, don't make du'a for rain without going outside of the, without an umbrella. Because, you know, that's essentially what Hajar salam, did. Because, like, why run? Like, you know, like, what sparked her run? It wasn't that she saw a bubble. Like, did she see a bubble beneath the ground? No, she didn't. It was an internal seeing that she was seeing, right? And because Allah is Al-Shakur, one of his names that I want to share, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala amplifies, he notices, he appreciates, he's Al-Shakur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so Al-Shakur that he rewarded her, her sabr and her sa'i, her effort, not just with rain. Allah could have sent her rain, you know, that, that lasted her enough, right? Allah could have sent her a fruit basket or people or anything, right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally burst the ground beneath her that not just lasted her, but until now, how many of us have been punched by Zamzam? Right now, there are millions of people drinking from Zamzam, right? And you can count the number of steps she took in her sa'i, but you can never be able to count the amount of people that Zamzam has quenched in this earth. You can't count that. And that's how Al-Shakur Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, that we always say, well, what is this? One dua going to do? What is one effort going to do? What is one dollar going to do? We're always limiting ourselves, right? But Allah is al-shakur, right? And, and subhanAllah, Hajar's story is just one of many, right? SubhanAllah. And so that's one name, al-shakur. The other name I want to share is al-fatir. Al-fatir, subhanAllah, is uh, you, you, uh, you hear it translated as the originator, Right. Yeah. But uh, my teacher taught me that, you know, it's similar to Al-Khaliq. So Al-Khaliq is the creator. Right. But, you know, so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he created us, Allah says he created us from Tleen. Right. So Tleen was then created into right humans. But then Al-Fatir is Al-Khaliq min Adam, which means the creator who needs nothing. Right. So Al-Fatir can create something for you without anything else ever being in existence. That's al-fatir. And that's something uh, Razia said, subhanAllah, when, when she was saying that, you know, we are the ones who like, we're like, where's the door, right? Where's the, where's the outlet? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can create an outlet for you in a place where no door ex existed, right? No, nothing, like, you know, you could be locked, trapped in, you know, cement, and Allah can create an outlet for you. We're the ones who are stuck in the how, right? Allah is al-fatir. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the originator who can make something from nothing for you, from literally nothing. Right? And, and sometimes it's it's so hard for us to fathom because we're so stuck in logic. Right? We work through logic all the time without even recognizing it, right? It's like how, how, how? But subhanAllah, our fitra, our the, the our origin tells us that Allah doesn't need something to create something for us. Right, so those two names for me personally have been just subhanAllah, such anchors, especially, you know, al-shakur too, right? And because, you know, so many times, you know, people can belittle you or, or tell you it wasn't enough or look, you did the effort and what a waste, you didn't get the outcome. But it's not about the outcome for a believer, right? It's not about seeing the outcome. It's about knowing that Allah saw your steps. That's all that matters. Because at the end of the day, you're returning to him. Allah tells us in Surah Najm, the only thing you have is your sa'i. So focus on that, right? Leave everyone and everything else. Allah sees you, that's all you need. SubhanAllah. So jazakallah khair for that much needed reminder. SubhanAllah. Alhamdulillah. It's perfect reminder uh, before Arafah. So jazakallah khair for putting this together and for these beautiful reminders. Alhamdulillah. Um, I, 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 can, can I just throw in one thing? First of all, of I course. love um, <laughs> mashallah. I just wanted to, you know, you said, our, our logic I'm like we don't it's not even logical it's the limitation of our imagination 
Because yeah. when, when Allah Subh'ana does answer the dua, you're like, oh my God, like that, wow, why, you know, I didn't see it this way. Or, oh, yeah, that totally was possible. I'm like, no, it's just our imagination is so limited and you know, we have to catch when we project that. So we think it's like logical to, oh, like how could that happen? Like, no, it's not. Like we're so, we're such weak beings, SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Oh my God. I'm so grateful to both of you for making the time to spend with us and our viewers and our attendees. And for those that will look at this later, uh, mashallah, we are always um, in awe of your of your um, message, of your ability to share with us and reflect with us. And, and I think that's been something that we're all truly appreciative of. And again, I'm truly grateful to both of you. I'll, I'll reward both of you for spending the time with us today. I would like to take the time to remind viewers about Nisa Helpline and the work that we do. We are a non profit registered Canadian charity that offers free anonymous and confidential 12-hour telephone line support to women across North America. The service is open seven days a week from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Our counselors are primarily Muslim women who are on the line and um, available to support you. Uh, on the topic of dua, I have heard so many of our counselors um, share um, examples of callers who are simply calling to have somebody to make dua with and I you know would like to remind you of the counselors make dua for them of the service that we have of the the sisters that continue to use our service and uh, our need for your support uh, in addition we also have a tab on our website on nisahalpine.com on dua there is a list of duas there there's some neat downloadable duas um, we also heard so many from Sister Samia that I'm probably going to make a list of du'as that we need to go and add to that to our, uh, to our du'a tab on the website. And then if you've if you've heard one today, or if you found that you would like to see a du'a that resonates with you on our website, we encourage you to share that with us on the chat of um, wherever you are watching this recording. Uh, in these last 10 days of Zulhija, your support is crucial for Nassau Helpline. Your donation empowers us to provide a lifeline of hope to women in need. You can go on to my10days.com slash nassauhelpline-ca or nassauhelpline.com to donate. Uh, we truly appreciate the time that you've spent with us, our our viewers, our participants, uh, there's quite a few of you online tonight, and I truly appreciate all of you taking the time to spend with us. I wish all of you a lovely afternoon uh, and the benefits of the last 10 days. Enjoy. And if I don't see you, Eid Mubarak. Until then, take care, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>